There's an interesting word in the King James Bible, and it's the word hope. Um, in our vernacular today, the word hope means, I'd like it, but I'm not positive, I'm not sure. I, the kid says, I hope I get a new bike for Christmas, but he's not sure he's going to. Most of the time, <clears throat> in the authorized version, uh, when it says, my hope, it's uh, the blessed hope. It means literally a confident expectation. It is that which you can expect to happen with absolute confidence Amen. as though it has already happened. So I want to open this afternoon with that wonderful hymn, My Hope, My Confident Expectation is in the Lord who <clears throat> gave himself for me. This week, actually next week, well, I will conclude 44 years of a traveling ministry. I graduated from the Bob Jones Institute of Christian Service in 1969, got married that August, and entered the ministry as an assistant pastor for eight years, and then in the fall of 1977, entered the ministry of full-time evangelism. By the way, it's nice to see one of my bosses here. There she is over there, Mrs. Anna was one of my bosses. I, and I, I still turned out okay. <laughs> she and her husband worked in the snack shop along with, along with Miss Sarah. And boy, I can tell you some stories about what, but that's not why I'm here. <laughs> uh, they, had a, they had a rule there, you know, where you're supposed to put, they had those little square ice cream, remember those little square ice cream scoops? So when I was in the snack shop, I, <laughs> He's with the Lord now, so it, I, 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 she's not there anymore, so I can't get in trouble for telling you this. I'd have more ice cream hanging on the outside of the scoop that was on the scoop. And a uh, little blob, so I'd pay, I'd pay 10 cents extra for this. I want a blob of, of uh, whipped cream, not just a little thing. So one day, uh, I got in trouble for that. So, you know, you're going to lose your job if you don't shape up. So one day, I went over to Winn-Dixie, and I bought myself a can of Ready Whip. And I got one of those little ice cream dishes, and I just, oh, psh, about this high with, with whipped cream, you know. And I went walking past the window like this, and Miss Sarah was in the back, and she saw that her eyes got big, and she came around. You, 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 and I, then I showed her the can and showed her the receipt, and then I almost got paddled. <laughs> but she was a very, very special lady. I, I had some interesting times. I guess all the kids eventually have interesting times there that we don't always like to talk about. I want to continue by playing for you a wonderful hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. It's interesting that uh, there was a lady riding a, a train. I, I forget if it was New York or London, but uh, she was kind of, there was an older man sitting across the seat from her and her child, and, and she was singing that lovely tune, Come Thou Found, and he looked up with a very sad face. 
He said, ma'am, you are looking at the wretch who wrote that song. <laughs> prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. He was the man who was prone to wander and backslid and had some real serious spiritual issues. But that lady singing brought conviction to his heart through his own song. Come thou found of every blessing. for this old hunk of maple and spruce and ebony. And uh, someone said a violinist is a guy who plays the outside of a cat, the outside of a horse on the inside of a cat, with the horse hair strings, and, but they're not cat cut strings. They never were cat cut. They were sheep intestines anyway, originally. <laughs> but this violin, a lot of people ask about it, was made in 1767 in Bologna, Italy, three years before the birth of Beethoven, and I'm very thankful to have it. Now, there's one of the techniques of playing the violin, it's called pizzicato. Not pizzicato, pizzicato, whereby you pluck the instrument. And there are actually three ways of doing that. The most common way is this way. And then there's a the left hand pick, which I cannot do. That's left to Itzhak Perlman and his trail. Um, but the other way is to hold it under your arm and and pluck it that way. I find I get a little more <coughs> mellow sound out of it. And so in this next arrangement of I will praise him, I'm going to have a whole verse where I'm going to hold the fiddle and pluck it like a, like a ukulele. And I, I trust it will be a blessing to you.
Um, my ministry, many of you may not know this, but I, for the last uh, 44 years, Barbara and I have kind of specialized, if you can use that term, in a small church ministry. I don't turn down large churches, but uh, the Lord has burdened our heart to labor in many times small struggling works that, for example, pastors would say, well, I can't, we can't afford to have you come. We're just a small church. I said, no, pastor, you can't afford not to have me come. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm willing to come by faith, why don't you have me on faith? And trust the Lord. If I'm willing to trust the Lord, why don't you trust the Lord for whatever? God takes care of our needs. We do have monthly support as missionaries. That enables me to be able to do that. But a lot of churches don't have, these churches don't have special music. And so it's a real treat to go in there, and even with all the mistakes I make, to <laughs> encourage them and be a blessing to them. How many of you know what this is? <clears throat> Pardon me? It's not a mandolin. It's not a banjo. It's not a banjolele. It's not a ukulele. You know what it is. Bandura. It's a banduria from the Philippines. Now, there are two bandurias. Uh, th- this one from the Philippines, which has 14 strings, and the other one's a Ukrainian instrument that has 52 strings. I actually played a duet. It's kind of almost like a lap harp. I played a duet with a gal from Russia who played one of those things. <clears throat> now, this is often mistaken for a, a, a mandolin. It does resemble a little bit in the look and the technique and the sound that's produced, but there are three major differences. Number one, the mandolin has four tones, this has six. Number two, the mandolin has uh, two strings for each tone totaling eight. This has three triples, two doubles, and a single for a total of 14. The other major difference is that the mandolin, like the violin, is tuned in perfect fourths, whereas this is tuned, or rather perfect fifths, whereas this is tuned in perfect fourths. Now you may say, well, what difference does that make? Well, I'll tell you, it makes a lot of difference when you're used to playing one and fifths to go to one and fourths. Here's how it works. Let me explain to you. Um, when you tune a violin, you play your open string going up the scale, your first finger, your second finger, your third finger, and the fourth finger becomes the next, uh, the equivalent of the, of the next string going up, the note going up the scale. When you do it in fourths, you play your open string, your first finger, your second finger, now your third finger becomes the same as the next note going up the scale, which means these two fingers are optional. That's what was confusing for me. <clears throat> so you can or don't have to use these two fingers, which leads me to another interesting musical fact. How many of you are familiar with Victor Borga? All right, the great piano player. Did you notice he never used these two fingers when he played the piano? I was mentioning that to Miss, you all know Mrs. Gingery, right? That dignified piano professor over the university. She was in our home and, and she said, oh, you must be wrong. I want to tell you folks, it's nice to know you're right when you're debating with a PhD. <laughs> and I said, well, I can prove it. She said, well, he could, you, you have to, he could never play the piano as well as he did without those two fingers. I said, well, these, he never used these two fingers. I said, do you know why? She said, why? I said, because these two fingers are mine. <laughs> Dear Mrs. Gingery lost her dignity and chased me around my own dining room table seeking to do me bodily harm. Before I play, I do want to read to you a paragraph or two from a somewhat rare book called My Life and the Story of the Gospel Song. And it's by Ira Sankey, because I want to read to you about this particular song. <clears throat> the song is entitled, Hallelujah, Tis Done. How many of you know that song? All right, good. Uh, Tis the promise of God, full salvation to give unto him who in Jesus his son will believe. Sankey writes, a minister from England in telling of a certain meeting says, among the converts was a man somewhat advanced in years who is very anxious about the salvation of his wife and expressed the wish that I should visit her. I did so repeatedly and explained to her in very simple words the plan of salvation. But she could not comprehend the message of the meaning of my message. Every time I left, however, she would express a strong desire that I return. One day I went in just before dinner (coughs) and talked to her about Jesus, but no light seemed to dawn upon her mind. Then the thought struck me to sing something to her, and so I began to sing, "'Tis the promise of God, full salvation to give." When I was through the chorus, she exclaimed, Sing it over again. I did so, 
time after time. And when I asked her to assist me, she joined in very heartily. The light dawned on her dark mind while we were singing. The big burden of sin was removed from her heart, and her face was lighted up with holy joy as she exclaimed, Hallelujah, tis done. I do believe in the Son, I am saved. <clears throat> Just then, her husband walked in for his dinner, and she shouted out to him, Ah, oh, lad, I've got it. Hallelujah, tis done. Their hearts were full of joy with the wonderful discovery she had made. And I was grateful to God for a sinner brought to Christ by the ministry of this holy song. In compiling his book, Gospel Songs, in 1874, P.P. Bliss desired to publish it in the well-known hymn, Hallelujah, Thine the Glory, then much used in religious services. The owners of the copyright refused, and he wrote, Hallelujah, Tis Done, both words and music, to supply the want. Hundreds of souls have been led to decide for Christ by this hymn, and the church has reason to rejoice at that great refusal. So one publisher refuses, he writes another song, and here we go. Hallelujah, tis done. looking for all these instruments. Uh, I started out when I graduated from Bible College with the violin and that was it. And then a fellow in our church made an instrument called a theremin and I got that. And then the musical glasses and little by little <coughs> things just happened that way. The Clavinova, I was in a camp in West Virginia and we were going to go to the, there was a health food store in the mall and I was looking for some particular items and they didn't have what we needed. Well, right next to that was a music store, and across the aisle was a woman's dress shop with a four-letter word in it, S-A-L-E. 
So my wife said, well, I'm going to go look around. And I said, well, I'm going to be in the music store. She said, last thing I said to her was, don't buy anything. And three days later, we came out with that contraption. <laughs> but it has been a real blessing, and uh, it helped our girls learn the piano lessons as well. Back in the turn of the late 1800s, I guess it was, when, when uh, R.A. Torrey was the superintendent at what was then known as Moody Bible Institute, he received a letter one day from a father wanting him to take his son into the school. The son was sort of a, he was a rebel. I don't mean a southern, I mean he was just a troublemaker. And, uh, and, and Dr. Torrey wrote back and he said, hey, this is not a reform school. This is a school where we are training young men and women to serve the Lord. Well, so we can't take your son. And the father persisted, he wouldn't quit. He just kept writing and writing. And finally Torrey broke down and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll take your son on two conditions. Number one, he has to agree to abide by all the rules. Number two, this has been hard for you and me. He has to agree to meet with me in my study personally every week for one hour. Wouldn't that have been hard for us with Dr. Torrey? Well, the young man's name was William. After a period of several months, William came under conviction, came to know the Lord, and his life was transformed. Everybody could see the difference. Someone's suggestion, he decided to write his testimony out, but in, instead of doing it in prose form, in story form, he chose to do it in poetic form. And Dr. D.B. Towner, one of the music professors, set it to music. And William R. Newell's testimony, years I spent in vanity and pride, carry not my Lord was crucified. <laughs> Thank you. 
guinea pigs. <clears throat> Many of you have heard about my glasses and my, my fact that they died on me. They just quit working in the middle of a service and uh, I had to retire them and broke my heart to do it, but I had to do it. I thought I, especially these days with everything going out on, on, on live stream and all over the world, your people are watching you not do what you're supposed to say you do, you know? So I said, okay, Lord, um, they're done for. Well, we began to look around to find glasses, and I found that same set one of you were telling me about, uh, a set of 10 that you could play a little scale on. Um, but that was not sufficient for this, and, and I contacted Corning Glassworks to find out if they knew anything. Actually, we, we conclude we just wore the glass out, uh, just after 47 years of playing them. <laughs> they put me in touch with two companies. One was Finkenbinder in Boston, was makes the replicas of the Franklin harmonica. And the other was the Glass Duo. If you make a note, glassharp.eu, uh, you can go in and watch this couple play the world's largest glass harp. Now this is called a glass harp. Uh, these glasses are individually, professionally made. They're hand-blown <coughs> in Poland. And uh, they're pre-tuned, so I don't have to put any water in to tune them. I'm not that clean up, just kind of wiping them off. However, the major problem is my other set was lined up like a keyboard, two rows, white keys and black keys. Real easy. <laughs> These are arranged in three rows chromatically. So where, uh, C's not here anymore, C's over there now. D's not here, D's here, E's over here, and, and whoa. So I put a white disc under all of the glasses that, have, that are the equivalent of a white key on the piano keyboard. So this is the first time I've attempted to play it in public. I've been practicing. I've only had a week at it now. So uh, I tried to put something together. I will probably make some mistakes. I'm just warning you ahead of time. <laughs> One of the benefits of this, however, is I can play. I can play three and four at a time. But to do much with that, that still is yet to come. So let's see how this goes. See what I mean?
him by Charles Wesley. When I was growing up, my pastor had some, what I thought were strange habits. For example, over a period of time, we would sing every hymn in the hymn book. And we would sing songs, I'm thinking, wait a minute, nobody knows this. No, why are we singing? Nobody knows this. And <coughs> you realize the reason nobody knows this is because nobody sings it. And nobody sings it because nobody knows it. And you get into that room. Well, he broke that. And as a result, you know, I was introduced to hundreds and hundreds of gospel songs and hymns. When we'd gone through it a couple times, he'd give them to a mission. We'd get a new hymn book and start all over again. <clears throat> of course, I was the wise guy who would always pick for their favorites the Sevenfold Amen by John Stainer on the inside back cover of the hymn book. You know. That's a beautiful piece of music, but only one word, Amen. <laughs> one of my favorites uh, is one that I want to play for you now. This arranged for unaccompanied solo violin uh, by Charles Wesley. Love the vine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down.
this is a very special book, not only because it's God's Word. I had this book recovered. My cousin found it in her attic, and she said, Ken, I think you ought to have this. And I looked inside, and she said, I don't know where I got it from. I was going through some stuff. And here, lo and behold, right here it says, To Evelyn from Mother, Christmas 1927. Hmm. Well, I recognize the handwriting. Evelyn was my mother, and Mother's writing is my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother. Uh, can't think of her name right now. <laughs> <laughs> she had beautiful handwriting. So this was probably my mother's first Bible. And uh, so I was looking through it. She, uh, I, I knew that I thought she'd gotten saved in 1937, shortly after, or 1939. But she has here uh, October 15th, 1939, 10:30 p.m. Here are my Lord send me. I think, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like a testimony uh, verse to me. So I was, I was reading through this in my devotions, and uh, and it has surprisingly interesting or a good sized print in here. And I came to a verse, and she has things. Verse is covered in green, yellow, red, and blue pencil. And I have no idea what, that, what, the, what the colors signify. But here in Romans, I came to this verse, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might possibly be saved if God has time and place, right? No, <laughs> shall be saved. Amen. But right here, she has written, you can't see this, but right here she has written May 24th, 1936. And an arrow pointing to that verse, the day that my mother got saved. Ten years, about ten and a half years before I was born. Now that, to, to me, that's exciting to have a mother's Bible like that. I was raised in a Christian home. When my parents moved to Chester, Pennsylvania in 1950, I was four years old. And the pastor said when he was introducing me when I was preaching as a Bible college graduate, he said the first time I met Ken Lynch was in the beginners of what was their very first Sunday in our church. And Miss Gish, who was born old, she just never changed, you know. <laughs> she was one of those spinster ladies, had this nice, deep, mellow, soothing voice. She never married, never, but she had kids all over the world who were in her Sunday school class. She loved children. And you couldn't help but love her, too. And, uh, but she was having trouble with a new kid on the block. And Pastor said he walked in the Sunday school room, and there was little four-year-old Kenny Lynch jumping up and down on top of the lid of the grand piano. <laughs> so I guess I had music in my bones even then. <laughs> I made a profession of faith at the age of five. Uh, you know, we were taught heaven's a wonderful place, and I'm not putting the problem on the Sunday school teaching. I will say this, those who teach young children have to be very, very careful because they don't always get what we're trying to teach them. One beginner's class teacher was teaching her class about Lot's wife and how she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. You know that story. Mm -hmm. And Johnny raised his hand and said, Teacher, Mommy was driving her car to the store this week, and she looked back and turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> so <laughs> totally, totally missed the point of, of, of the lesson there. So my understanding was heaven's a wonderful place. It's where Jesus is. And if you want to go to heaven to be with Jesus when you die, you have to, quote, ask Jesus in your heart. A false gospel. No one is saved by asking Jesus into our heart. We are saved by grace through faith. Doesn't depend on us. God does the saving. But I based my salvation upon that for 10 years. In the junior department, I memorized 300 Bible verses to earn a copy of Mrs. Eggermeyer's children's Bible story book. I uh, was active in Youth for Christ, and uh, it's where I met my wife, and, and active in the youth ministry, the music ministry of our home church. And one Saturday evening, we were singing, I was singing at the close of a, of a two-week-long evangelistic campaign in one of our sister churches on a Saturday night. Remember those old rounded churches and the a big overflow room back there? That was packed, chairs down the aisle, chairs across the front. There was no place for the choir to go. We had to stay up in the choir loft, way up there where everybody could see us. And folks, I don't know what the preacher preached on that night, but I remember one thing he said. He said, you can believe the whole Bible and still go to hell. And it's like, like typical evangelists, you know, let me say it again, <laughs> you know. Lynch, are you listening? And that, folks, that was, the, that was what God used to strike conviction in my heart. The try as I would, I could not extricate. I raised my hand for prayer, but unfortunately, the evangelist never looked at the choir. I recently, well, a couple of years ago, preached at a church of about 900, and 
and I, I, the choir had, the choir had twice as many people as I usually preach to. And I turned around and said, now just because you're in the choir doesn't mean you're right with God. Give, give them a chance to acknowledge if they need to be saved. Well, I, they sang all five verses of Just As I Am, which is a short song. But when you're under conviction, it seems like a hundred verses. And I remember praying, Lord, just help me get through this invitation. I was actually praying and asking the Lord to help me not get saved. I'm glad God didn't answer that prayer. <laughs> I survived the invitation. One of, my, one of my brother's buddies, which about a year ago, I was finally reconnected on Facebook. That's one of the things I like about Facebook. I often wonder what happened, whatever happened to him. Paul Spedden was his name. And he leaned over and said, hey, Ken, if you want to go forward, I'll go with you. And I remember shaking my head. No, I'm thinking, what are people going to think? I'm, a, I'm an active, baptized member of a local church. Let me challenge you folks, it's time you stopped worrying about what other people think and started worrying about what God thinks because it's to him that we're going to give an account. Well, I survived. I thought, well, uh, can't wait to go to church tomorrow. Church on Sunday? Yeah, we had early services. My mother was the special music broadcast on the voice of Chester WVCH. And then we were there for Sunday school. And then she sang in the choir, so we were there for the 11 o'clock service. And then we had 6.30 youth group. And then we had 7.30 evening service. Five times already under conviction. You talk about misery. So, man, I can't wait to go to school and drown my troubles in algebra. You can't drown anything in algebra. <laughs> I survived the Wednesday afternoon. You know, I, I would wake up in the middle of the night terrified. Wake up in a cold sweat knowing if I died in my sleep, I'd go straight to hell as a baptized active member of a fundamental Baptist church just like Morningside. Wednesday, we had a day off from school, and uh, my mother was in Tupperware, and Mom and I have always been kind of close. I don't know what my brother and sister did that day, but I went with my mom. We had an old 48, the old, it wasn't that old back then, but it was an old 1948 Dodge Deluxe the sedan with the suicide doors and the little triangular windows. Man, they, they were, I wish we had those things back. <laughs> and, uh, and I just amused myself, and on the way back, I have never known anybody in my life ever who can talk to anybody at any time, at any place, about the Lord like my mother could. She'd go to Burger King, her favorite restaurant. She'd have her, her junior Whopper without, without pickles. That way she knew it was fresh. And a cup of coffee, she sat down. She's having lunch. She sits with a lady in her 80s. She'd never met her before. Before lunch is over, she leads her to the Lord. Undertaker, the, uh, not the, Undertaker, the cemetery, came to sell them cemetery lots. And once they sold that deal, got my parents signed the dotted line, Mom said, now let me talk to you about your soul, you know, and led the, led the guy to the Lord. So we started talking about the things of the Lord, and I blurted out, Mom, if we die in a car wreck on the way home, I'll go straight to hell. And I'm so thankful my mother did not do what so many parents do. Don't you remember 10 years ago when you asked Jesus, you know, don't you remember when you prayed? My mother, folks, I would still probably be lost. My mother said simply this, son, you know what the Bible says. Wow, sure did. Memorize those 300 verses a few years earlier. I took a counselor training course in Youth for Christ on how to lead a teen to Christ. Yeah, mom says, you know what the Bible says. And well, I don't know what we talked. We talked a while longer. And finally, she pulled the car over to the side of the road. And it's, it's now the right-hand turn lane on Route 352 in Brookhaven, Pennsylvania. It was, it was just the side of the road then, just dirt. And she pulled the 48 Dodge over to the side of the road. She reached in her purse. And she took a little Bible. And she led me to Christ. Amen. And I remember going to prayer. It was a Wednesday. I remember going to prayer meeting that night. Sitting in the back row. Backsliders row. Like all good Baptists. Right? <laughs> Pastor said, anybody have a testimony tonight? And I stood up. Yes, sir. I want you to know I got saved today. Boy, did the heads turn. You mean we got unsaved church members? You bet we do. And there's probably yeah, some right here right. at Morningside. My dad got saved at the age of 75, the same age I am right now. At the time of his conversion, he was serving of an, an, an independent fundamental Baptist church, just like Morningside. He was chairman of their deacons. For 45 years, he professed without possessing. Right. So I'm thankful to the Lord. I'm so thankful my cousin found this, and I'm thankful I can actually read it. It has, it has nice-sized print, doesn't it, for for a little Bible. Mm -hmm. it's, it's surprising. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you and encourage you, you know, at our age, and I include myself in you, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in next year, in, in October, I will be sweet 16. 
with 60 years of experience. <laughs> That's how we do it, right? Not, I'm not 39, I'm 16 with 60 years experience. But seriously, folks, we're, we're coming to the end of our life. And I don't know where you stand with the Lord, but I do know this. One day, each one of us is going to stand before God and give an account. Are you ready for that day? Do you know him? Four questions I like to ask in my meetings. Number one, are you saved? Number two, do you know it? Number three, do you have a Bible reason on which to base it? Not because Mama said I got saved when I was two. We're, we're in diapers in the crib. And number four, does your life reflect it? Because if you are saved, your life ought to reflect. I appreciate your attention. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. I don't know about you, but I've had fun. I'm all sweaty now. I go home get a shower. But, but I've, I've enjoyed the time, and I hope it's been a blessing to you as well. Do have a few CDs over here if you're interested. Uh, they're all music CDs. One's Christmas carols on the music. Not these glasses, but other glasses. And, and I have other stuff for you if you're interested. So thank you.